Okay, welcome to the uh, session number five, the last one before lunch. Nanotechnology Mimicking Living Systems. My name is Professor Franz Geiger, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the session speakers today, uh, Professor Monica Olvera de la Cruz and um, Professor George Schatz. Professor de la Cruz is the lawyer, Taylor Professor of Material Science and Engineering, Professor of Chemistry, and by courtesy, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering and of Physics and Astronomy. Her research focuses on developing theoretical models to determine the spatial relationships, organization, dynamics of macromolecules in complex environments. She has developed novel methods to analyze complex systems, in particular, molecular electrolytes. Her group is designing functional nanostructured materials by developing algorithms to describe the organization of amphiphiles, copolymers, and polyelectrolytes into fibers, gels, membranes, and crystals. They analyze interfaces in complex fluids and identify their relevance to biology and biomimetic functions. Professor Alvera de la Cruz received her undergraduate degree in physics from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, which is great because I studied there myself for a short time before coming to uh, uh, college. After earning her PhD in physics from Cambridge University, where I did not study, she joined the faculty at Northwestern. She's also the senior editor of ACS Central Science, member of the Gordon Research Conference Board of Trustees, and many other things she's asked me to not mention. <laughs> professor George Schatz is Charles E. and Emma H. Morrison Professor of Chemistry and of Chemical and Biological Engineering. His research has contributed to the theory and computational studies to some of the most important problems in contemporary nanoscience, including studies of SIRS, surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy, and plasmonics, DNA hybridization leading to functional nanostructures, peptide self-assembly, carbon-based nanomaterials, energy transfer processes, transport phenomena, catalysis, and photocatalysis. Professor Schatz received his undergraduate degree in chemistry from Clarkson University and his PhD from Caltech. After a postdoc at MIT, he joined the faculty at Northwestern. Schatz has published three books and over a thousand papers, and he was editor-in-chief of the Journal of Physical Chemistry from 2005 uh, to 2019, overseeing the largest growth in that journal in its history. The 2000, in 2010, he appeared on the Times Higher Education list of top 100 chemists of the past decade, and he has been on the Thomson Reuters Clarivate list of highly cited researchers since 2014. Please welcome me, uh, welcome the, to the stage our session five speakers, Professor Monica Ovila de la Cruz and Professor George Schatz. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, I am going to be talking about uh, what do we imitate or mimic in the biological systems. And the first example I'm going to talk of is making chemicals. And you might say, oh, we have a lot of very good chemists here and everywhere. They do the chemical. The, chemistry well, but the biology can teach us a lot of things, and I'm going to show you the benefits to copy the way they do chemistry, with example of plastic degradation. So all of you know that actually the lifespan of a bottle of water is 450 years, and there are tons, uh, 56 million tons of plastics produced of the type that I'm going to talk about, which is called PET. It's a most common polyester of your clothes and uh, in the bottles. And so uh, we actually discover, or the people discover in 2016, a bacteria that I cannot name uh, is there, that actually eats plastics and convert it into energy and food. So um, this plastic, the PET, um, we want to know how it does it because we want to recover outside the cell these uh, monomers that it converts it to to make new polymers and we don't have to do more chemicals. And so you have to take out the enzyme it uses, which is uh, PTase, and make it work outside. Now, the normal cycle for the bacteria is that it has the sun, the sun heats up the plastic and it can degrade it. When we take it out, we have to make it enzymatically active and heat up a little bit the plastic, which is PET, and um, be able to keep the shape that it has. Enzymes are made of many amino acids and they have a compact shape. So what we did is we actually make polymers, designed polymers that are compatible with the surface of these uh, enzymes and they can actually encapsulate and be uh, covered in a soft coat so that it still has the materials coming in and out and be able to degrade. And we were able to actually prove that indeed we protect it and we can heat up and it doesn't degrade the enzyme. 
So this is a nice example of the collaboration here. And uh, there are other ways that we actually also um, use um, mimic biology to make chemicals. And this is another example is imitating organelles. In some type of organelles, it's the cells make its own energy and uh, chemicals, and it does it in aggregates. And some of the aggregates are very similar to this, what I show, an enzyme covered by a polymer. Um, but they are biomolecules. And so we had been able to cover other, with polymers that we designed, cover other enzymes, many of them. And you can actually dry the, the water. And then, because the polymer likes organic solvents, you can actually polymerize and make a mat, a really piece of clothes that can actually be enzymatically active. And we made one that um, degrades OPH, organophosphates, which is materials that are in chemical weapons. So this is for the cells like in our body, we have these uh, organelles, but bacteria doesn't have those. They have a different type of ways of making chemicals. And they, they have bacterial microcompartments, which are actually crystalline shells made of many proteins. And they encapsulate the enzymes in there and they take from the outside media harmful materials and convert it into their own fuel and nutrients for the cell. And these tiny um, shells are crystalline. So what we were able to do is, for example, modify the amino acids by some theoretical thing, the size which amino acids are responsible of co-assemble the many proteins to form these very complex crystalline shells. And uh, if you modify, you can have the shape. But not only that, you can modify the pattern that this uh, micro compartment has. And here I have one example of a pattern polyhedra. And you know, if you don't, um, if you know the viruses can be, if they are close, can be spherical, and when they grow, they buckle into a cosahedra, which is a very simple shape. But what we discover, actually, theoretically, is that if you mix two components, you can actually form much more complex polyhedra. And there's this very clever polyhedra. For example, here you have a red color, which is very rigid molecules, and they, if you co-assemble it with one that is more easy to bend, which will be the blue, then they form this very complex decorated shape that when you actually see the micro compartments, they look identical. And um, the point is that you see how smart they are. They can, for example, the, the red part can absorb the components that are harmful, and then the bending part is more open and can filtrate them, and then they go inside to actually convert them, and they can go out. So this is an example of what uh, we can do with theory and then also, you know, experiments. Oh, this is the other one right there. So we can even be more clever and try to do ourselves the vesicles, right? So you can make a polymer, polymer sums are called, and um, with the catalyst in the surface. And we have shown that if you actually mechanically poke these uh, materials, you can actually induce a chemical reaction, which is autocatalytic, and, and change the shapes. And this is to show you how much more functionalities you can have. This is something that in, 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 in biology will be called chemomechanical stresses, right? You induce, like how you form an organ, you have to get some triggering thing that just makes the chemistry to, to add things and change. So. Um, with these micro compartments, I want you to see the size. Um, this is 150 um, nanometers. And of course, the bacteria is like 10, 15 times larger than that. So they're very tiny. But they have some property that the bacteria has, which is chemotaxi. So these materials, and my colleagues here at Northwestern, were able to encapsulate them in this vesicle polymer zone and put the damaging component, the PD, uh, 1 to PD, in one side and show that when they, they move towards it, like flagella will move, uh, like bacteria can move towards food or nutrients. So um, they actually then get the, the harmful material and, and convert it in, in a fuel propane. Okay, so this is an example of, of this type of micro compartments. So what we do, you know, theoretically is, uh, well, now we try to see how shapes, you know, different shapes can be used to propel things. This is a, a film of, um, in the reference frame of the particle, but it, the red is actually the, the product after the reaction occurs coming out, and that product like that actually also propels the particles. So, you know, what we're able to do, you know, theoretically with experimentalists do is to design 
you know, different uh, shapes by changing the composition of the shells and the shapes to be able to see you know, what kind of uh, motions uh, they can have, these materials. You know, uh, they rotate and they move and so on. This is chemotaxi. So that brings me to actually swimming. And um, so these things are moving, and you want to know how do they move, right? I mean, um, they can move by hydrodynamics and, and, and other things that we know happen to large bodies. Like when you go to swim, your body is so large that you know the, the, the viscous drag of the water is not a big deal. You actually generate a turbulent flow and propels you. But if you go to very small sizes, there is a theorem called the scallop theorem, which tells you that if you just have something that cyclically does open up and closes, it won't swim if it's very small. You have to add other degrees of freedom. And these are like waves. You have to generate the formations that propel you. So on the top is this, it's an example of a squid that is using these waves to swim. But on the bottom is this organism that is actually 15 um, microns, which is like a billion times smaller than the, the squid. And so could you mind if it can swim? I mean, it obviously cannot generate turbulent flow, right? So it is very difficult. And they have to you know, design many, many uh, sort of creative ways to move. And so here is an example where um, if you want a bacteria to swim in water, which is very low fric uh, drag, um, uh, frictional drag, it can't. It would be equivalent to try to make a sardine to work in peanut butter. So you can imagine a sardine moving and moving. It's just not going to propel anything, right? So they, what they do is they generate these sort of um, shapes uh, changes. And we try to actually... Uh, do that. And so here is an example of what we did just to generate the waves. You take a membrane of polymer and you put inside some <laughs> particles that are called uh, superparamagnetic particles, which if you find, uh, if you have a magnetic field that you process around, they actually generate the waves. But you also have to break the symmetry because the scallop theorem tells you that cyclic doesn't work. You have to have non-reciprocal motion. It means you collapse the thing and you relax in a different way to be able to, to move. And so um, this on the right-hand side is an example of one that can move. So you break the symmetry. Either you can cut it or you can glue one part that is rigid to the one that has the magnetic particles. And you can do that at an interface absorbing supermagnetic particles in the surface. And now you can see that you buckle the one that is, generates the waves, and the one that is rigid is holding it. So you can actually propel that, and this actually does uh, move. Okay, so this is sort of the design that we do. And now we're going to work in, um, talked about other bigger organisms that we try to model, and this is work with some stoop. And um, you no know, propulsion and recovery that you can see for the jellyfish, these are larger organisms. and. Uh, he has make it swim, and the idea is to use a magnetic nanofibers that are in this hydrogel. The hydrogel has a, a, inside some components that when you shed light, they expel the water of the hydrogel. Okay? So when you expel the water, it bends. You have certain magnitude of, of light, and you can see that it swims, and all of the, the colors tell you, you know, how the flow around is propelling it. So these materials, you know, we're working on them. We have discovered to well, Sam put the light and they, they move towards the light and they have a lot of functionalities that are, we cannot discuss all of them here, but anyway, this is very excitable and happens, you know, a collaborative way to understand how to make these. One that we have very successfully now um, uh, uh, document how it works and, and, and the functions is a different shape. This is just a cross now because you want to make it stable. And this um, robot has the same, it, it, it walks in water, it rolls, it climbs, it delivers cargo. You put the light and it just compacts and grabs an object. I just accelerated here just so that you see, you know, how it moves afterwards. Um, uh, you can make it roll. And uh, this, you can also make it climb. You see, it goes up, down. Here, the magnetic field is called B, and is rotating. And that makes the thing, if you reverse it, it goes downstream. And you can also make it deliver the object that, um, that it grabs. 
you know, you put more light and it can open up and throw it. So you can imagine, this is actually a slight larger, but it's still three millimeters, right? And it's in a tank. And so just to show you how much we actually can control and understand these processes from theory and going back to the lab, uh, in this one I have on the left a theoretical um, design of a path for a robot made of the components and the characteristics that we put in the lab. And we designed the magnetic fields required and the torques that this little robot has to have to follow a certain path. Then we go to the magnet of Sam and we program with the same program that we put in the theory. And you can see how it follows. This is the experiment. It follows exactly the path. So it means you really can control where these objects move and how. So this is not a uh, human, it's a car, but basically I'll show you, you can brake, accelerate, gear shift, steer wheel, and be comfortable because you can show the light from whatever size you want to change the object. So George is gonna tell you how it works, what it has inside these materials uh, to be able to be in water and, <laughs> and survive. Okay, so uh, yeah, Monica talked about um, you know these uh, robots uh, that are activated by uh, mostly by magnetic fields. Okay, uh, I'm gonna now uh, move on and and talk about uh, robots, soft robots that are activated uh, by by um, uh, by light. Okay, and the inspiration associated with this, okay, is going to have to do with just doing something like this. Okay, uh, it turns out it's really hard to make soft robots that can do this, okay? Uh, and you'll see maybe why. Uh, the, okay, so, the, so we're going to be talking about, you know, thinking, the bio-inspiration that comes from thinking about just how do muscles uh, function, okay? And here it is. This is, you know, a, a, an image of basically a muscle, okay? And a muscle is a complicated structure. It consists of these myosin and actin filaments that rub against one another. There's hydrogen bonds that are involved. Uh, and, you know, it turns out this is just like within one cell, but ultimately you bundle many of these guys, the sarcomeres, into myofibrils. Uh, you bundle those into the overall muscle. Uh, it's, it's a hierarchy of different steps that are involved in the biology system. Okay, we're going to try to do something much simpler than that based on nano components, and we could use many different sources of, of uh, stimulation associated with these, but I'm just going to focus on light. All right, so, uh, so this goes back to work, again, from Sam Stoops' group, okay? The bio-inspiration is from Sam, uh, and, the, uh, and here's, the, here's the recipe, in a sense, for how it is that this works. Okay, so uh, we begin by combining three components, okay? Uh, photoswitches, which are small molecules that can absorb light and undergo some sort of transformation, such as an isomerization, that might change their uh, state in some way or another. Okay, uh, there's, in this case, we'll talk about a photoswitch that's called spiropyran. That's the hydrophobic uh, form. And then you, there's also another form, myrocyanine, which is a hydrophilic form of the same molecule. Okay, and you can transform one to the other by just shining light on it. Okay. Uh, and then we'll combine that with a polymer. We'll actually tether those, this, the photo switches to a polymer. This is an acrylamide type polymer. Okay, and then uh, we'll combine some of Sam's uh, important peptide amplifile nanofibers. Okay, that's going to form a framework that you attach everything else to. In a sense, it's sort of like the bones associated with your, the muscle that you want to move. Okay, and so that's the, those are the three components that go into this. This is just a little cartoon that shows how it's all organized. So the big structures are the fibers themselves. Those are attached to the smaller lines, which are the polymer strands. And those are turned attached to the uh, small little dots, which are the photo switches. Okay. And the overall goal, then, is to create a structure where you turn the light on, and that transforms it, in this case, uh, from the hydrophilic form to the hydrophobic form, and it contracts. Okay, that's the goal. And then you turn the light off and it goes the other way. All right, so uh, these are just showing you some of Sam's famous peptide amplifier molecules. You combine those all, all together and you can make uh, the 
and from this, you can, you can make these fibers. This is what the fibers look like on the, sort of the micron scale. We do simulations. Simulations give you more of the molecular details of the fibers. So this is something that we generated on the computer. And it's just a little teeny piece of the fiber. But nevertheless, it is what Sam makes. All right. And then we're going to covalently combine these guys with uh, the uh, polymer strands, OK, and with the uh, photo switches. And when you're finished on the micron scale, you get something that looks like this. All right. What do you get when you make it on the millimeter scale and you shine light? Well, you get something analogous to what Monica showed before, where you turn the light on, it, you know, it stands up. You turn the light off, it's, it goes down. OK, so in the end, that's a way then of making a robot out of just simply molecules, which are programmed in the right way. Uh, we have done uh, simulations of various types to understand the details of this. So this is just kind of the under the hood kind of pieces of the story. So in this case, we did molecular dynamic simulations. We have to build a hierarchy of structures. The fibers here, you're looking down the end of one fiber, so it just looks like, like a cylinder in the middle. We, initially, you just arrange the polymer strands and the, and the photo switches around it in some way, which is not important. You add water. This is like a, doing on a computer a recipe for building something. And you let it go. You let it equilibrate. It turns into this when you're looking down from the end. Or it looks like this. Here's the fiber in the middle and the polymer strands that are around it. OK, we've done it both for the hydrophobic state and for hydrophilic state. And of course, the key thing is that there's a change in volume of the system and going from one to the other. And so we've figured that out. OK, and here's, you know, again, there's a change in overall volume, which corresponds to about 5% volume change. And it's like, OK, so what's the importance of the fibers in this case? OK, it turns out that the volume change is smaller, about 3%, if you just leave the fibers out. So that's telling you that attaching these things to the bones is actually pretty important for this overall structure to work. All right. I'm going to change the gears and talk about sweating. OK, we all know what sweating is all about. OK, uh, you know, this poor guy starts running, raise, the temperature goes up, and then it turns out you start sweating. And what does that do? OK, it cools you down. All right, so the brain uh, is, in this case, uh, sensing that the temperature is up. It activates the sweat glands. OK, and then it turns out that leads to evaporation that, that maintains uh, a constant temperature for the body. That's called homeostasis. OK, it's the process you'd like to have. All right, how do you make something like this? Now we're inspired. We want to make something like that at the nanoscale. All right, and so uh, this is work from Terry Odom's group, OK, in which they built a structure that actually does this, OK? Uh, in this case, it consists of, I uh, can't see this very well on the screen, but there's a polymer that you're supposed to imagine is over here. It's actually over here, too. OK, uh, and the, the polymer is a hydro, hydrogel polymer that can absorb water and expands, or it can, let, it can evaporate water and that uh, lets, lets it contract. In this case, uh, you put the polymer on uh, the top of a, of a, of a uh, just a, a uh, a glass substrate, you have gold nanoparticles, OK, a gold nanoparticle array that's shown over here that you vapor deposited before you put the polymer. Then you go through the process, OK? Uh, first thing is to put it into the swell state. Turns out with swell state, it expands, OK? And so it's now pushing against whatever boundaries are in there, OK? Uh, also, when it expands in the swell state, it ends up having a flat surface. So I wish you could see this, but there's supposed to be a flat surface above this. OK, uh, and then, uh, OK, that's step one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to heat things up. The way we're going to heat things up is by shining light down onto the nanoparticles. The gold nanoparticles absorb the light. That turns to heat. OK, when you heat up the polymer, OK, it turns out then the water evaporates. That's the sweating process right there. OK, and then so in the end, when you heat it up, that, that also causes the, since the water has evaporated, now the hydrogel polymer will shrink. Turns out when it shrinks, uh, it will spontaneously form a rippled surface. So that's what this is showing. It has a rippled surface, OK? And then it turns out that light that was irradiating it, OK, it turns out now it gets scattered on the surface. That means that the light doesn't penetrate down to where the gold particles are. The light is therefore no heat is generated, OK? And so the system overall cools down, OK? Uh, and uh, so then 
this is just looking at what the ripples look like. This system cools down because of the presence of the ripples, and now you're ready to start the process all over again where you add the, the uh, you know, moisture and uh, you know, the system will now expand and, and have a flat surface. We've simulated this, and, and uh, Terry's group has, has done measurements. We're just looking at things like temperature as a function of time, and you can cycle this process over and over again. Okay, so that's the, the, how we finally got uh, simulations of, of the homeostasis property. Okay, so that was great success. We built these structures, and we had these functions that were bio-inspired. And to a certain extent, we can do this. Okay, but we are still have a long way to go. Okay, turns out that in this case, the energy source, the light, was all external. Okay, that's not what happens inside our body, okay, where the energy source is ATP. It's all generated on the fly. Okay, uh, and then uh, the other thing is the efficiency of light-driven processes is only a few percent. Okay, we've got a long ways to go. Could be, should be very much improved. And of course, the other thing is just we're building structures out of 100 nanometer sized components right now. We wish we could make those at much smaller dimensions. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, we have time for questions. If you have a question, please stand and um, ask for the microphone. All right, I'm going to uh, ask both of you regarding that last point um, and efficiency. What do you see in terms of prospects for improving efficiency on these uh, from beyond a few percent? Whatever. Well, uh, in the systems I talk about, they are non equilibrium, it's very difficult to define efficiency uh, in terms of how much energy you uh, use to. In do these processes, I mean, for the ones of the magnetic field, for example, they are really Tesla, you know, there are very small uh, fields that propel these systems, they are very small. And um, there are some, in the hydrodynamic things, they are, uh, you know, they are reversible in time, so they are, you know, they are efficient, <laughs> they're very efficient processes that don't dissipate. I don't know, um, for the ones with the light, you know, uh, Basically, they are the chloroforms you put, you know, the light turns them into hydrophobic. And I don't think you have to waste very much uh, power for that. I don't know if you have a comment on the amount. Well, so, so one of the problems we have with light is that, that molecules uh, just, th there's something called a quantum yield, which, which ultimately determines the ability of a molecule to turn light energy into some sort of a, of a mechanical energy, and those numbers are not very large. It's an active area of research. There's work, there are people in the chemistry department that are actively trying to come up with better molecules that are in that direction. But I think ultimately, the, you know, the, 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 what we're also learning on this is that other forms of actuation uh, are going to probably play an important role, and we'll see how, where that takes us. But you know, there's, there, we mentioned already the you know, thing, things that relate to uh, trying to do pH changes or, or looking at, at, at changes in chemical concentrations of various types. So I think there, there are good opportunities for this, but the light one was the one that I think is the most well-developed at this point in terms of trying to figure out how to make structures that are actuatable. Good. Thank you so much. Since this, oh, there's one question over there. Yes, please. and the magnetic-based movement? You see, that's why I put the film where we do a theory calculation with the experiments. This is, follows exactly. This is because uh, we're using continuum mechanics, which is a very robust field. And in that case, and very strong concepts, for example, you have to put, uh, it's not a slippery. So you actually design the substrate so that it's not a slippery, so it can walk you know, as opposed to slide and so on. So, and also the other things we use is the contraction and so on. We know very well the loss of how much the transfer of the light is through the gel and the water, how much gets absorbed, and that tells you exactly how much bending is going to have. And then we use uh, polymer physics to calculate the elasticity properties, which are very robust too. 
from many years. So the combination of all those things make it extremely reliable, as, of, as you saw, we can design and, and direct these, these robots very efficiently. Good, since we have a tight program, let's thank uh, Monica and George one more time. And I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask Chad to come up for an important announcement that's the best part of this meeting before lunch.